I had to clean the stove top the other day. Did you have to? Well, okay. So the oven's not worked for a little bit and we mostly use the, the toaster oven slash air fryer in the summer. Cause it makes the house less hot than the mm-hmm. real oven does. Understandable. So like the oven's been broken for a bit and, uh, the guy was coming to look at the oven to see what was wrong with it. And the top, like, I like to think that a thin layer of grease on the top of the stove top helps to protect the 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 That's enamel right. of the stove top. It's a lubricant. It's a sealant, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it's it's keeping the bad stuff out and the good stuff in. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like wax for your car. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. You're detailing your stove top. My wife possibly had some different ideas about the level of filth she was willing to expose outsiders to. I'm familiar with this phenomenon. Well, I get it. Actually, I I, I am with your wife on that one. Like, I also don't want to. So, yes, I'm generally pretty tidy. But in this case, uh, this is a place where, you know, I like I like to let the the let, let, let life find a way. Uh, so anyway, I cleaned it off. And, the, you know, that stuff that gets like the hard baked on kind of like they're like dark spots usually it's like it's like if you spill something with some fat in it it'll get cooked on there if the burner is hot and and then it's really hard to get off Mm -hmm. so i went to the internet as one does to find out how to remove these hopefully with chemistry or something that wouldn't involve me scrubbing for three hours and somebody on the internet said hey if you have a le crusette uh, an enamel dutch oven like one of those dutch ovens you have and you bought their fancy unnecessary for the le crusette dutch oven but totally necessary for other enameled cookware uh, cleaner, which is, I think, just something that's more basic than like baking soda, but less basic than like, you know, lithium hydroxide or something. It takes that stuff right off. OK, so I degreased the top and I I wetted the stuff on the sponge and I put it on there and I rubbed it on and let it sit for a few minutes. And then it basically like all of it, but the very hardest on there wipes off and it looks brand new for the first time in the like five years that we've had this oven. That sounds fun. I was I was hoping some like some beakers might be involved here, some Bunsen burners, like chemistry outing, but this still. So I looked into it further to see what was going on here, and it turns out basic stuff takes off burned off charred stuff, and the more the more burned on charred is, the more basic it needs to be. Um, and in, in this case, I mean basic is in the opposite yes. of acidic, not basic as in like a you know, bro. Why is why is your cleaner so basic? Yeah, like is, uh, is this is this is a very chemistry ignorant question is is alkaline another term alkaline for that? Also, yeah also basic okay. yeah okay so like you're, oh, you're are they're not synonymous you can't just say like this is an alkaline no alkaline is basic mean the same thing yeah they, okay alkaline is probably the the correct term for basic okay because okay. yeah. as as you have identified sometimes hard to use the word basic in another context yeah, in no, conversation. nobody nobody wants to be basic unless you're cleaning off hard stains or coating on an apple too well not even then yeah but but anyway so, yeah, so like I got the soft brush out, like the soft dish brush, put this stuff on, scrubbed it just a little bit. And it pops right off and the stovetop looks super clean. And he came out and he looked at the the pilot light and he's like, well, in an old oven, this would have been about five minute fix. And I have the thing for it in my car. But since this is all got computers and shit up in it, uh, I'm going to order the parts. It's going to be here in a week and I'll come put them in in about five weeks. Yep. I've got to replace the main board. Got to update the firmware. Like literally he had to, re- there's a temperature sensor inside the oven. There's a, there's a assembly for the, where the gas comes out. There's a computer that he's going to replace the whole computer. Cause that was bulging in a weird way. I was like, why is the computer bulging? He's like, I don't know. I'm just going to replace it while I come while I'm coming. It's like, well, okay, that sounds good. And I was like, if you don't get it in this time, he's like, we'll probably just give you a new one. Cause it's easier. And I was like, that sounds great. Can you imagine what the cooling needs are or, or maybe more to the point how like industrially hardened the computer hardware in an oven has to be? Well, I will tell you exactly how much it is, because when I bought the oven, the guy at the store was like, yo, don't run this at 550 degrees for a long time because it will literally melt the solder in the computer on the Great. backboard of the, of the thing. I was like, that seems like a design flaw. He's like, yep, if you're going to do it, just do it before the extended warranty's <laughs> up. And I said, Fantastic. <laughs> Um, I have a suggestion. What if we stopped putting computers in everything? Well, so here's the interesting answer to that is if you buy a $10,000 cooktop, like a wolf or a Viking or something like that, they don't have a bunch of computer shit in them. They're all still manual. Huh? Yeah. So the manual, the Luddite answer is the expensive answer in this case. And if you want to buy like a thousand dollar range, it's going to have a bunch of computers up in the business. Hey, who, who doesn't love paying more for less? Well, 
welcome to Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod. I'm Will. I'm Brad. Hello. Hello, Brad. Uh, we, uh, this week's episode, a uh, little bit of a potpourri because we've uh-huh. both done things in the real world yeah. this week. Yeah. Um, post, posting a few hours late on Sunday this week because you were, instead of recording a podcast yesterday, you were out at Maker Fair. I went to Maker Fair with my daughter. Um, this is the first, I was thinking about this while I was driving over there because it was in, it's on, uh, it was on, um, uh, what's the island in Vallejo where the first naval base was? In, Al- in, not, not Alameda. No, no, it's not Alameda. It's the north, the other one. It's the one where the first naval base in the Pacific was. Oh, jeez. Um, yeah. A- anyway, it's uh, May Island or something like that. Not, not Angel. No, Angel's. There's no the Angel's undeveloped. It's um. A- anyway, it was like an hour drive. It was 50 miles. Um, and this is the first Maker Fair that's happened since we started recording this podcast because huh. they canceled the 2021 for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. And then 2021, they canceled. And 2022, it, they just announced that they weren't going to do any more Maker Fairs. Oh. And then like June of this year, uh, they were like, hey, we're doing Maker Fair. <laughs> just but kidding. It's going to be smaller. So why did, the, why, did, why did they initially say that it was just done? I, I, I mean... I'm so make also publishes a magazine and I'm going to suggest that maybe the lack of like, I think those two businesses kind of fed each other in a way that maybe they were having business problems. I see. And had to okay. do some restructuring in order to uh, survive the lack of the, the mothership maker fair, which, which brought a couple hundred thousand people to San Mateo, usually one weekend in May. Jeez. That's, and that's pretty serious attendance. It, it was big. It was, maybe it was only 120,000, but that's it was a lot still, of people. I mean, that's yeah. like, I'm, I mean, I, you know, E3 is kind of my common point of comparison, but that's bigger than E3 ever was. Yeah. And if you've ever been to those fairgrounds um, for like a county fair or whatever, it's it's big. Like it's a big it's a big fairground. There's like three or four big, huge warehouses that were full of stuff like indoor stuff and computers and stuff like that. And then there were also like a hu- couple of huge outdoor areas that had like, bi- you know, bicycle like crazy bicycles where the where they set gearing systems up on so that the handlebars made the wheel turn the wrong way and you had to like rewire your brain to ride a, a screwy bicycle or like a bunch of people would bring like burner cars and 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 stuff that they take like burning man sculptures and stuff like that would come uh so anyway i was very excited when i found out the maker fair was back it's my, my it's been my we used to cover it we started covering it the first year of tested in 2010 um we went every year we went to the new york one a couple of times um it's it's one of my f- I, I always said it was my favorite event of the year and it absolutely is because it's, it's such a good wide range of people who are enthusiastic about stuff that it, even if I don't like, even if I'm not personally enthusiastic about it, the, the, their enthusiasm is infectious and it's cool. And it's mostly just people who build cool shit. Yeah. Like even, even the, the brief description you've just given me is completely counter to what I thought it was. Cause like being in the office with you guys back first couple three years you were doing it i my impression of what maker fair was if you'd asked me i was i assumed was just like a bunch of vendors showing off new 3d printers and cnc hardware and stuff like that i didn't realize this is like totally grassroots diy like this sounds way more interesting and fun yeah so it's it's i mean there is that like there's a section there's usually a 3d printer pavilion with a bunch of th- like in the early days it was MakerBot and and like the right. the, the two other printer companies and some open source weirdos and i and i say that with love just to be clear uh and then oh, as the years progressed, it was 30 different pr- 3D printer vendors that were set up and, and like a bunch of stuff around that. But it was big enough that that was just like a small part of the of the thing. Um, we would go like my favorite thing to do is just to walk around and look at the at the things people made. And, and like the just so people understand the scale is it's all the way up from like. Like a kid, like the the way the way you get into maker fairs, you either pay the money or you submit an application and say, hey, I have a I have a project. Here's what the project is. Here's what state it's in. It's either most of the way done. It's all the way done. It's been done in like out in the world for a while or it's in progress. And they'll give you anywhere from like a section in a 10 by 10 booth to like the these kids used to build uh, three fully 3D motion simulators for flight sims out of like. I mean, just to be clear, they were children of parents who worked in Silicon Valley and probably made a bunch of money and the parents spent a lot like, but it was like the computer club for their school yeah. and they would build this, this huge thing and they'd bring it to Maker Fair and the science museum over in the East Bay and a couple other places. And, um, I, I like all those kids ended up going to MIT and Caltech and stuff like that. So like, um, it, it's, it's a, it's a really wide range and like some of the best stuff I've seen, like there was a, there was a seventh grader who made a maglev train um 
like a like an electromagnetic maglev train out of Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and stuff like that. Wow! And it was basically like the acceleration system for like a roller coaster or for the maglev trains in Japan or Germany or whatever that he just rigged up with some electromagnets and some like scale to some train tracks and stuff. It was really in, cool. In, in microcosm, obviously, I'm sure it was. Yeah. How, how big was it? Like kind of electric, like model train size? It, or? Was, I, it was a small scale model train that he used as the, as the frame. And it was, the track was probably like six feet around or something. It wasn't particularly like, it wasn't enormous. How, how fast did it go? Uh, it did not, it, it went, to scale, it was very fast in the real world. It was, you know, it was, it was cool that it worked. Like okay. that was the, the neat thing was that he made it work and go around corners and stuff. Cause like it's, it's relatively easy. Like you can make a maglev system with some, with some neodymium magnets that like will take you a half hour to build. But the fact that he had it going around corners and stuff was pretty awesome. I thought, yeah, that's, that's not, that's so awesome. Like I'd certainly don't have the aptitude or, or skill set, but like just thinking conceptually about what it would be really like to like write the routines to, drive the magnets and stuff like that, like conceptually taking those principles and expressing them well, through, and, through and code the point, and everything. The point of the whole thing is that actually you probably do have the skill set to do that. Like when you get down there and you start the, the thing that I told my daughter yesterday going, this is the first time she's gone that she was probably really old enough to ask questions uh, uh, for the people there. It's like, look, the people here, you don't have to be shy around these people. If somebody brings their stuff to Maker Fair and has it set up and they're standing there next to it, they're there because they love talking about it and they love to share that information. And if you have questions about it, you should just ask them. Um, and, uh, and like people are very giving, like I, I talked to a guy who makes these laser cut wooden clocks about how he was putting designs on them. He's like, Oh, we, we originally just did decals and painted them. And then we were doing this and this and this. And then finally, when we started selling a certain number, we were like, we should just buy an industrial inkjet printer and figure out how to print directly on the wood. And, and like, it was, it was be, like, so that, that, that is that dude's business. And he was like, was here's how I do it. Interesting. Right? I was going to ask, are there people there that are making full-time livings from is that his full time thing or is that a side hustle? I didn't ask him if it was full time. My guess is it, it it's probably the kind of thing that's like the dangerously on the cusp, mm -hmm. as as I think you're aware of. You and yes. I have a unique perspective on that uh -huh. um, because it's like, yeah, you know, if I if I really hustled, I could probably make this work. But then what if people yeah. stop buying 3D printed wood clocks for like whatever you, reason? You definitely, you definitely in that position start getting into calculations of like, OK, it's maybe not quite a living, but how much time am I putting into it? Right. It's like, it's, yeah. it's a return on time investment kind of calculus. At that point. Yeah. Um, so, so there's that kind of stuff. There's a lot of like crafty stuff. There's like people that are making cookies and selling cookies, like commercial, com like small scale, commercial homemade cookies, basically science cookies, just cookies. Oh, like they're okay. just like, they're like, there's a mixture of stuff that you find at the fair and like the county fair and then also like maker stuff so there's there were like people that were building um uh kits to do different electronic stuff and they were selling those kits uh on the site so you could so you could buy a little bag that had everything you need to make like an led christmas tree ornament that you could solder at home or even solder there if you if you wanted to sit down and wait in line and, and take a soldering station um they do like like learn to the learn to solder tent was always a really popular thing that where they bring like kids as young as like three or four and they sit them down and they teach them the right way to solder and well how to that's, be safe and man, all that awesome. kind of stuff that is awesome because soldering is something that's just arcane enough that Ideally, you would want to talk to somebody who really knows what they're doing. You know, like I, I managed to fumble my way through a few PlayStation one mods 20 years ago and yeah. I can solder, I can solder like speaker wire or whatever back together. But like talking to somebody who really knows what they're doing and getting to use like their nice stuff, that's man, that's invaluable. Well, they were doing like through hole soldering on PCBs. So like right. they were learning how to actually do like the, the kind the of soldering you would use for a real project. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a lot of like college uh, classes and clubs that are bringing their demos like one well, local local college I can't remember which I think I think it was Davis but I'm not 100% had brought a um, a sand table that was like a um, so it was like a big table full of sand that was all mounted up and then they had a connect camera hanging up above it about five feet in the air that measured the depth of the sand and then a projector that projected a topographic map on top of that so you could sculpt the sand to look like mountains and stuff and then you could hold your fist above it to make a cloud that would make rain fall on the sand you could see how water would run down the side of the sand and it would fill up the projection with a representation of water where the water was holding where there were lakes and ponds and stuff and like we just sat and played with that for like 15 20 minutes it was really it was like as my daughter said this is really chill i like this is like an asmr video but we're in this big thing wait 
Did she say it was like an ASMR? Kids like ASMR videos, Brad. Oh my God, the kids know about ASMR. That's the, kid, the kids know, you have no idea what the I kids actually, know about at all. The kids created ASMR probably. I, I don't uh, I don't think it was the kids that created okay. ASMR. Actually, you know what? <laughs> Let's probably get into um, Anyway, wanna, this, this thing, yeah. this, this thing, this sounds like the world's biggest science fair, actually, which... <laughs> It, yeah, it kind of is. Yeah. It, but then there's also other stuff. There's like like there are people that there there was a back section with industrial arts people where there were like potters and glass blowers and metal workers that had little portable forges set up and were were like basically kind of there advertising their their. Hey, you can learn to be a potter, learn to be a metal worker, learn to be a glass blower at my studio if you want to come take lessons in my studio. Um, and that was that was fun because then the side effect of that is that they're saying they're blowing glass all day and you get to watch people blow glass all day, Damn. which is really fun. This w- w- weird, uh, weird tangent here, having downloaded a bunch of HDR uh, uh-huh. demo content for my new TV. Glass blowing looks amazing because <laughs> a lot of a lot of that HDR. So there's a bunch of glass blowing in some of the oh, HDR yeah. demo videos I downloaded. It just looks incredible to it's watch a- somebody do it like both the like the bright glowing aspect of it and just the really fluid motion of of shaping the glass and everything it's very nice to watch i think i've recommended this on podcast maybe not this one before but um if you don't if you haven't watched it there's a show on netflix called blown away that's a canadian reality show in the kind of um, vein of great british bake-off where like the hosts are kind to people instead of being mean and it's like an uplifting experience because the, the, if you watch it, if you watch it starting from the beginning, the first season, it's very clear that like there was productions that was like, we got to make these people fight with each other. got to make it really angry and really super dramatic. And then like two episodes in, they realized that the mere act of blowing glass was dramatic enough because mm-hmm. like touching it on something that's not nuclear hot will make it just explode. Yikes. That it was dramatic enough on its own and they could they could be kinder and gentler to the glass blowers. And um it's it's totally worth watching if you're curious about it because you learn a lot about glass blowing if nothing else. Um so yeah like it was it was uh there's there's all sorts there's like a lot of sculpture stuff. There's a lot like and and okay so this is an important note. The different maker fairs have different tenors based on where they are. So like the San Francisco one has a lot of burner stuff, you know, stuff that people take to Burning Man, like like little cars, electric cars that are designed to drive around the desert and big metal sculptures that shoot flames and stuff like that. When we went to the one in New York at at the at the Queens Fairgrounds, um, you know, for Men in Black, they had a bunch of people from like the from the New England uh, technical colleges. So there was a ton more robot stuff and drone stuff. And like the technical high schools in New York would bring teams that would that had done projects like there was a there was a high school in Brooklyn that the kids wanted to do a flight club like a like a remote controlled airplane club. But it was too expensive because like like the typical like for somebody learning how to fly remote controlled airplanes, the circle of life is that you spend a hundred hours building the plane. You take it out, you fly it for four minutes, you crash and you spend a hundred hours fixing the plane. Mm -hmm. And like, they couldn't make that work on a school system. So they, so the kids instead engineered like flying wing, a flying wing design that was just a cheap foam wing with ailerons on the, on the two wings uh, and like two little basic servos and an electric motor that would power the flight. And it was like a $50 flying aircraft so they could learn to fly on the cheap and then and then have a path up to that didn't involve spending hundreds of hours and thousands of dollars building airplanes that would just be destroyed. Um, that's, that's very cool. So, yeah. So like we saw the industrial arts demos, we looked at the burner cars, we got to climb into the burner cars, which is kind of nice because it was a little smaller. We looked at some of the big sculptures. There's a huge Ori there. Um, an Ori is like a representation of the solar system that moves that the planets move at the right rates, maybe yes. not like one to one, but like a scale mo- scale speed of the of the rates of movement. Um, and it was that was big enough. It fit in like a warehouse. It was like a it wow. was it was huge. Um, there was like a big scale Lego build that if you want to sit down and just build some Lego, they were building, I think, a typhoon class nuclear submarine. Um uh the r2d2 and bb8 and chopper builders clubs were there in force are those are those people trying to like replicate the props exactly or is it more like riffs on r2d2 little from column a little from column okay. B. there's definitely people that want to make like film accurate 
um, like, for example, there are two different colors of blue used on R2-D2, depending on which movie you're trying to replicate, right? Yeah. Uh, there's there's R2-D2s that have like the prequel arms and all the stuff that pops out of the front. There's R2-D2s that have a lightsaber hole in the top that'll shoot a lightsaber out. There's periscope R2-D2s. There's some combination of the others. There's like somebody made the it's funny. People used to make pink and and non blue you know, different color colorways of R2-D2. And then the people at Lucasfilm who are making the Clone Wars cartoon took some of those and actually put them in the Clone Wars cartoon. So now they're now the the R2, the Bay Area of R2 Builders Club's R2s are now some of them are canonical. Huh. Um, the uh, let's see, they did. Uh, this is the first time I've seen a chopper in person. Uh, chopper is the robot from Rebels. And it's I think it might be the first time. I don't know if this is the case, but I know that one of the guys who was one of the big R2 builders, original guys built the chopper that they drove around Disneyland um, to promote the rebels when it was new 10 years ago, eight years ago, whatever. Oh man, I just looked at that thing is a true trash can. Ch- chopper chopper is like if, if R2D2 is chaotic, good choppers, chaotic evil. Yes. Chopper's real good. Um, but but yeah, so the R two D twos are just driving around. the The R two D two that was cruising around, they take turns going around the the fair and like because hey, turns out children love R two D two. He's I, the same no, height as them. He beeps, he whistles, he spins. Uh-huh. He's exciting. So they, um, they, I assume they build pretty decent speaker systems into a lot of these. Oh, almost always. Like the yeah. the thing about the R two builders clubs is they've been doing it for a long time now, and there's multiple generations of plans. There's like fully analog ones that you would have built like ten years ago that have a lead acid battery. The more modern solid state ones are lighter and a little bit easier to, to operate and can do more stuff. Um, the that's, that's contr- a, oh, oh, sorry, it's just that the whole that whole that whole scene of like the the really authentic movie prop replication scene is so fascinating to me because like you have to be so exacting in a lot of details, and also like you know there's just there's some kind of mystique to seeing something that you've seen on screen in a fantasy setting suddenly right in front of you. Like it's just a, it's a cool thing. Having it be real in front of you is pretty amazing. And there's like a, there's like a power to that. And, um, especially for the little kids, right? The little yeah. kids, the, it, it's, it, it is, it is exciting for me, and but watching kids, yes. Wa- watching little kids hug yeah, R2D2 yeah. is very good. Yes. Um, and those guys have gone like, like those are the people that originally, like they, they were one of the early prop replica things, right? The R2 builders clubs have been going for 40 years now. Whoa. And, and it's like, it's a, it's a thing where the mechanisms by which they build those, it's too much specialized hardware for one person to kind of make all of it in less than like a 10 year period. So they do runs where everybody, where one person is like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to machine out a bazillion of the, of the bearing that the head spins on. And one person's like, I'm going to make 50 doors and I'm going to make the feet and I'm going to make the, this, and I'm going to do oh, this. So and you, interesting. you all like everybody, you send your money for the, ring bearing to one guy and then or you trade your thing for that for the other guy and like it's a very much a community effort each time there's a run of those made and, and, okay and, so i was i was envisioning like each group had its own bespoke design that they came up with i didn't realize it's like that standardized and distributed at I this mean, point is, is there a consortium defining the 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 interconnects in your r2d2 unit I, I think everybody like this. The thing is, the at this point, because of microcontrollers and stuff like the Raspberry Pi, the internal stuff and the and honestly, the rise of drones has made the radio stuff a lot cheaper too. Like that stuff is is a lot of personal choice. But like the bearing, the bearing for the head is a really expensive piece because it's a big round, uh, circular bearing that's like a foot and a half across, and it's a kind of screwy size. So you, either somebody has to make a bunch of them or you have to find a supplier that will sell you 200 so you can get 50 for the group of people that are building at that moment. Um, it, it's uh, it's it's uh, it, it, but it, it's and just to be clear, people absolutely do still just go out and build it on their own over a long period of time. That's and that's totally, totally valid, whatever. But the larger, faster, easier way to do it is to work with a with a people group of people doing a run and just and just put them together. Yeah. I could have my own R2-D2. Brad, the thing that they do now, they used to use like RC controllers, like the big ones with the antennas and stuff to control them. But about 10, 8, 10 years ago, they started, somebody started designing uh, Wiimote style controllers oh, wow. that you could just fit in the, hide in the palm of your hand. And they do like, it's, it's basically the same idea. Do you know about the Stormtrooper blasters at Disneyland? Oh, 
So the Stormtrooper blasters have a bazillion little buttons on them and they can kind of cord commands to make the speaker in their headset, make them all have Stormtrooper oh, voice. So they, they have like a palette of like a hundred things that they can say or 300 things they can say that are controlled by hitting different, you know, infinitesimally small switches on the blaster. Interesting. In, and that has to in combinations. All, all be tactile, I assume, right? Like they can't, it's not yeah. like they can look down at their blaster to punch codes in. Like they have to probably learn some pretty, pretty sophisticated input scheme yeah it's i it's a lot of memory i'm sure um and so the 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 r2 controllers are like that now so like we were sitting there my daughter was interacting with r2 i was looking around everywhere trying to find the dude that was controlling r2 to thank him and it, i eventually i'm pretty sure it was a guy who's kind of standing off to the side looking at something else but just kind of staying there and he had an earpiece in so i was like he's listening to the people talking to r2 up close and he's doing the remote control stuff with the with the controllers in his hands and and just driving around and you know doing r2 stuff it was really cool that's very cool. I am on the official website of the R2-D2 Builders Club looking for, okay, they don't exactly have like a link to just like click here to buy kits necessarily, but I'm curious like how much it would cost to build your own whole ass functional oh, R2-D2. you're talking thousands of dollars. Oh, it's, oh a God, lot of, okay. it's a lot of right. bespoke right. parts and, uh, and, and also probably a thousand, two thousand hours. Like it's a lot okay. of work. Oh, wow. Also, I'm looking like my make magazine actually is like the the second uh, the second Google result for building one. Uh -huh. The one they've got photos of here that they built is not distressed in any way. It is like pristine, like right off the factory floor. Seeing a completely clean new R2-D2 is like a weird. It's, like, it's, it's hard to parse because you're so used to seeing that thing very like scored up and, and burned and stuff. Well, he, he shows up clean in the movies a few times, like at the end of the like the metal scene in Star Wars. He's he's gotten a bath. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's really cool watching the different ways people weather them and different ways people handle them. And then also like the Wally -E club is building Wally's. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, Wally's -E a little trickier cause his scale changes throughout the movie cause it's animated and, sure, they, and Pixar sure. cheats a little bit. Yeah. Um, so there's basically a few different scales that people build at for, yeah. for Wally. -E. Also there's like, I mean, I don't know how much this is replicated in the builds, but like there's a real like human facial expression aspect to that character that would be probably pretty hard to replicate mechanically. Nope, you can do it. Wow. Uh, okay. That's uh, cool. Mike, it turns out the hard part is the treads. Huh. The, the treads were, we did a video with, I think Mike McMasters, maybe I can't remember. It might've been the other Mike whose last name I can't remember, um, who builds R2s and Wally's a uh, long time ago. And he, uh, he walked us through like the hard parts of the, the Wally. -E, it turns out like it, it was interesting because being on the beginning stages of the the Wally -E was way different than coming in late to the R2s, right? Where like R2s, are, the problems with R2 are well established and people know what they, what they are. The problems with Wally -E were having to figure out and they were having to do custom treads and all like it was all because it was animated. It was all off the shelf stuff. I mean, it was all custom stuff rather than R2-D2, which started out as a physical prop that was made with basically stuff that you could find in a hardware store in England in 1975. So... Anyway, uh, the, while the, the builders clubs were there, we um, they had some steam engines there, which was really cool. We uh, we got to get uh, we got to ride a push cart. The kiddo and I got to ride like a railroad push cart and push, wow. push the bars up and down, which I'd literally never done. Never seen that before. Sounds fun. Um, and like a bunch of other like there's like people bring stuff that they love. Like somebody had brought a bunch of like small scale motors and engines so you could see how they work. And and it was it was it was a lovely oh. it was a lovely spent. We spent like half a day there probably. So it's okay. definitely smaller. Like the old maker fair, you could you Norm and I would go and spend two days shooting video basically. Um, and now it's this is this is a little bit smaller, but I think it's a good good start. And the the new venue is pretty nice. Yeah, that's, that's good that it came back. That that sounds like something valuable to have. Did 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 you see any like new bleeding edge hardware in like the three D printer space or anything like that? Or like were the, were the vendors even there? Or um, th well, there were a few people with three D printers. I saw Raspberry. Uh, Eben was there. I didn't get to see him, oh. but he was there uh, talking about Pi Raspberry Pi fives. Yeah. Um, I think the thing <laughs> when we talked to him earlier this year, I was from the way he was talking, I assumed like at least a year, year and a half before a Pi five. And then like six months later, here we are. Yeah, it was, um, it was, there were a lot of people there. It was, it was nice cause it was smaller. It was a little harder to get to. Um, so you were able to kind of see more stuff and you could talk to people more. Um, I talked, we talked to, uh, we talked to Lisa Winter, who's a former BattleBot contestant, Robot Wars contestant, and I think is now a judge, actually, um, who's working with uh, this company, Eliza Dolls, 
that are that are basically building like uh th- their whole thing is hey uh like if you're a parent, you have a graveyard of STEM toys that you bought for your kid that they just didn't have any interest at all in. Um, and they're building dolls for girls specifically um, that that you can do scratch coding. And and like the girl, the dolls have microcontrollers built into the chest. You can hook up those microcontrollers to a bunch of different things and then do scratch, write scratch programs that you can blast over to the doll with Bluetooth from an iPad because um, they were like, well, look, we looked at what the kids have. We looked at what they like doing on and like what they're doing on stuff like Roblox and things like that. And we wanted to give probably younger than my daughter, who's 10, but like seven and six, seven year olds stuff to do that like mimics that same thing that I had when I was learning how to write C for Arduinos, which was, Oh, I wrote a program in the light changed color, which, which makes like, it turns out making an abstract concept concrete is really, really valuable for, especially for early stages of learning this kind of like, like abstract problems like programming. Um, so yeah, that's, they're doing a Kickstarter later this year. Um, but like stuff, we, other stuff we've seen, like we saw, um, Jerry Ellsworth brought her AR stuff there over the years. Um, like it's, it's a place where people, the open ROV people brought, uh, underwater Rover kits, like tethered oh. underwater robots. Wow. Um, cause they, they literally looked at, they were looking at what was happening with drones and, um, they were they were looking at they're like hey look man we could build underwater rovers that are oh, that's awesome a fraction of the cost oh man like, that's like, awesome like there are places that you need expensive things to go to like the bottom of the ocean but also if you want to just go into a cave in mexico and explore the cave you can buy something that's like not disposable but like a thousand dollars you can build something that's a thousand dollars and is really effective at that like and at they, least at least down to a few dozen feet probably oh way more than if, that if not hundreds, hundreds of feet but yeah, yeah hun- hundreds of feet the the they're disposable because you like if they get stuck in current it gets sucked away and they're you get in a sure. current that's faster than they can handle you can't pull them back right sure, sure. or um, you know if you're exploring like some some tight cave system or even a wreck i don't know what the yeah. like like legal aspects would be of like uh, like fair diving, game diving a robot around a wreck but like uh, i could see all kinds of cases where the robot could just get hung up and uh, become irretrievable well or even if you have like a pond with a overflow <laughs> and you need to build a robot to to like you can use or you could use those to clear the duckweed that gets jammed up in the in the spillway of your of your uh of your of your small pond so I, yeah I, I assume those those must all be tethered right i think that like radio communication through water is basically a no-go not right? good yeah it turns out so yeah those um, are all tethered oh, that's uh, so cool they put cameras on them and stuff the I assume. cameras grabbers so Man. the way those rovers work is there's a, there's a um usually there's a body that's enclosed and watertight and then there's like a cargo there's two two fins on the top that you can attach a tube to that you can put cargo on that cargo can be either like all grabbers and and like nets to hold stuff they can be cameras they can be whatever you want so Man, uh, that makes you me ballast it appropriately yeah that, that makes me think about we, we talked about the 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 ss ohioan it's a shipwreck right off the coast of san francisco yeah we talked about it a few weeks ago yeah 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 like i we haven't been up there because a it's really hard to time with low tide uh to actually get up there like last time last i checked low tide was it like 6 a.m or something but b the other thing is i found out that like the wreck is like far more degenerated than i thought it was it's like i think it's basically just like a pile of metal yeah the the bay at this point but like what you're describing makes me think about and also i don't know (laughs) i don't know what the park rangers would think about this up there but like if you just go up there on the beach and like feed that little robot into the water and like go go explore around the base of that wreck and just look at stuff up close would be so cool well, and the, I mean, they're obviously you don't want to lose them intentionally, but because they're tethered and, but they get power from the shore rather than batteries. Like if, if you do lose a drone, it's not like you're leaking acid and battery goo into the water for, for 50 years after, after it, it gets lost in an underwater cave or something. What kind of mobile power source are we talking about? You no. have a long wire that the, there's a data wire and there's a power wire typically. Okay. So you, you have just, it plugged into a, like a, a big lithium ion battery, giant, or, giant battery. Or, or like boat, like a alter, like a cigarette lighter adapter or something on the, on the, oh, wow. on the, on the boat. I right? guess, I guess a tiny robot really doesn't need that much power, even though there's a lot of mechanical stuff there. 
Yeah. So the, I mean, but the, the, the smart thing about the open ROV design, and I don't think they, there was somebody else there doing open, open source underwater rovers, but I don't think it was the open ROV guys. I didn't, uh, my daughter wasn't interested, so we didn't stop and talk to them. Um, but they, their whole thing was they wanted to do cheap off the shelf parts, which is why they were able to keep it under a grand. And, um, Oh, this was a Kickstarter. This was long. It was one of the first Kickstarters. It oh, was wow. early, like 2010 okay. or 2011. And, and here's their GitHub repo for all the software that runs on the robot. Yeah. And they do, they do, a, um, they've built at this point, probably tens of thousands of drones and sell a bunch of kits. And like, I mean, also if you have a laser cutter and the ability to cut acrylic and glue acrylic, you could just build one yourself. You don't need, you don't like, it's all open. Right. Huh. Wow. Um, it's just easier to support the project than it is to, source the parts yourself um so yeah that the eliza doll the ori like it, it was it was for people who've gone to san mateo maker fair it's for the it's the big one it's definitely smaller like it's it's a little bit more out of the way um but it like the tickets were also cheaper so i was kind of it kind of works out um and it was a lovely way to spend an afternoon with my daughter we we had a good time walked around we bought a clock nice Got a corgi seems, clock. The corgi, like, the corgi clock. The feet go back and forth. The tongue goes back and forth in the mouth. It's very, very good. good. Seems yeah. like a good place to get a good novelty clock. Yeah, it, it was. It's just a nice like you. It's the kind of thing you go to and you you get inspired by. Yeah. And yeah. and because it's a smaller venue, they're doing it twice. So it's it's this weekend that we're recording this episode. That this episode's coming out. If you're in the Bay Area and you want to go, it's also going to be around next weekend too. Oh. Um, and if you, I think the thing I would tell you is if you buy tickets off site, they're cheaper. Like both parking tickets and the tickets to the event are cheaper uh, than than if you buy them on site. So. Cool. Uh, you get your event bright on if That's you're going to go. Great that it came back. I, since, I am, since it sounded like it was just dead and then all of a sudden it wasn't. I am beyond thrilled that it's back. Uh, and it's at, it's at, um, I'm trying to figure out, it's Mare Island is what it is, not May Island. Sorry. Apologies. All right. Get your island straight. No. I guess. I know. I don't know my Bay Area tiny island. It's a really small island. Um, Brad, you want to talk about your PC stuff? You've been, yeah, we you've can, been, we can, we can get into it a little bit. Yeah, we, we, we're, we're just potpourriing it up here, and this has been on my mind the last couple of days. I'll talk about. It. I may do, no, <clears throat> excuse me, I may do nothing here. Um, really? I've been having, I've been having some issues with my, with my AMD build over the last month. I clearly am not alone in what that. What kind even, of issues? Just even, out of curiosity, even on our Discord, the issues seem to be specific to the motherboard I'm using. I don't think it's an AMD problem. Is it like crashes yeah. and stuff like that? It's a weird combination of crashes where, and basically this is like 10% of the time that I turn the computer on because the other 90% of the time it's totally fine. It was totally fine hundred percent of the time from like April to September. Right. Yeah. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, and this seems to be common to people running into this issue, things just start going to shit is the best way I can explain it because it's never quite the same crash twice. Like, Oh, that's not what you want. It's, it's a combination of like it, the machine may just never post. Or it may post, and then this this is the weird stuff, like parts of the system start sort of failing, whether it is Bluetooth or networking or USB or some combination thereof. Like you I've just had, hear the doo-doo sound and it disconnects? It, it's, not, it's not that clean. Like it's not like Windows just suddenly doesn't see it. It's more like, oh, I was in the middle of downloading something on Steam, and then the entire system seized up and oh, wow. started updating the screen about once every second. And then when I rebooted and looked at Event Viewer, I saw tons and tons of storage errors in the log and also saw the Bluetooth device. It's I guess that's what I'm what I'm getting at is stuff where you need to dig into the event logs to actually see what failed in some cases. Although there have been other cases where the machine was more or less still responsive, but none of the input devices worked anymore because the USB had died. Jesus. It's just it's just super random. And again, this is this is only maybe the like I'm, I'm running into it like at, at most, I think I've had it happen maybe three, four times in a week at most since this started about a month That's ago. Still a lot. It's, it's enough to be annoying, even though like, and this seems common to everybody. Like it's basically a situation where you just hard power off and turn it back on. And <laughs> you're basically looking for a good boot. Like it's basically a crap shoot. If you're going to get a good boot or a bad boot. And most of the time they're good boots, but when they're not, it's pretty catastrophic. Is this for all the first, first like wave boards from no, Gigabyte? No, no, or is no, this no, just no, one dude. specific board it's, has a bad rev? So until today, it's all, it's been hundred percent like looking on Reddit and me and one other guy on our discord. It's all been the X670E RS Master, which 
I believe is the board that most people reviewed these CPUs on. So it was just pretty like widespread. And oh. I think probably a lot of people picked it up because it was the board people were using to review. Um, uh, someone else on the Discord popped up with the same same issues today that is using an RS Extreme, though, which is kind of same chipset and kind yeah. of the same. It's not the same model. There are absolutely differences. Same between. vendor, though. Yes. Same same vendor, same chipset. Um, this this does seem like a gigabyte issue. This does not seem like a widespread AMD issue. Does it seem like a thing that they could fix with a firmware update? That, or that's is my it? hope. That's my okay. hope. But um, that's the other thing. They have been they've been pretty slow on rolling BIOS updates out. It's been three months since the last stable BIOS. Oof. Um, they put out by uh, beta updates, but I kind of am not in the running beta BIOS game anymore. But people on the Reddit who are using the most recent beta BIOS are having the same issues. So still, still happens. And, oh boy. To be clear, this could be like 0.1% of the people who own this motherboard. Yeah, but the fact but, that we've seen three people on our discord have similar yeah. problems with the same. I mean, part of it, the sample skews high because you built a machine with that board and people probably followed. Yeah. I mean, I know specifically one of them said I bought this board because Brad built his yes, machine with it. Makes me Sorry. feel terrible. I apologize well, for that. I mean, but it happens. That yeah. happens. Um, um, so anyway, it's 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 kind of a bummer anyway, like because this has been going on, like maybe they fix it in a BIOS update. I think I'm maybe willing to give it till the end of the year or something and if it's not fixed by like january i might be like all right enough of this um, time to do something new yes so i but my options seem to be just replace the motherboard with a different vendor because I, that doesn't this does not seem to be an issue across this entire platform or if i'm swapping the motherboard anyway should i also just move to an intel system instead <laughs> Oh, give it up. Huh? Like like this this following on from the emulating CPU thing earlier this year is kind of a lot for this new the, platform. I mean, the emulating CPU thing was relatively narrow, though, it seems it, like in retrospect. Yes. Well, it was a systemic issue, but it was only manifesting in like burnt CPUs in a small number of cases. Yeah. But the but the voltage issues that were causing it were very were endemic. Like right. like there, right, you know, there right. were there were emergency BIOS updates rushed out because like Basically, everybody was handling voltage wrong. Some CPUs just couldn't take the heat is what I'm I saying. Guess, if you had a weak CPU, <laughs> then you got what you deserve. Maybe you just need to, the CPU just needs to go to the gym. Yeah, just um, stop skipping the leg day CPU. Yes. And anyway, now I'm, I'm a, a, I may do nothing if this clears up. Although even like if it clears up for some couple of months, like am I ever going to truly trust this thing again? I don't know. And of course, and you this ever is really all, trust any computer, Brad? Yeah, that's, that's the that's question actually, we all need to ask. That's a very good point. Uh, and it's only because, you know, this is this is not just my personal machine. It's also my work machine that this is such a dire thing. Like it needs to work. It's it's um, it's funny. I was on full nerd with Adam and Steve from Gamers Nexus this week. And we were talking about what your benefit, what your what your reliability metric is. And he's like, well, you know, if I mess up my computer, I can just go into the one of the other computers in the office and use it. And it's no big deal. And I was like, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> if I yes. mess up my computer, I don't make money that week. And he's oh. like, yep, that that gives you a different kind of uh, it's lost work. Any yep. lost work is bad. Yep, that's um, absolutely the case here. Um, so anyway, yeah, like like I said, a, I'm not sure I ever want to trust this board again, even if they do supposedly clear the stuff up. Although to date, there's been no indication they have been able to do that or will be able to do that. I should also mention there are people on Reddit who have already made this board at least once, if not twice. And the still, replacements still doing and, it. And the replacements eventually manifest the same issues. And that's actually the weird thing is that it seems like in all cases, it takes some time for these things to start breaking. Um, that feels bad. Yes. It's, it's, it's one of those nebulous, like, is this thing good? Is it going to continue to be good for another two or three years? Or is it just, yeah. So, so anyway, I might swap the motherboard. I might swap the whole thing. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know that like you've had your issues with Intel. So it's not like Intel is perfect these days either, but you know, it's, it's been it, like compared to the 9900 K machine I built a few years ago, this machine has been frustrating. We talked yeah. about that on this yeah. episode too. It, like it's, it's between memory CPUs dying, memory dying, all sorts of other stuff. It's been it, like, it's everything's more complicated. So there's more po points of failure. It seems I guess, like, I guess that's what it is like combined with, you know, just the calamity of the last three years. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. Yeah. feels like, feels like things maybe are just, are just at a rickety place right now. Um, that said, you know, 14th gen Intel stuff is coming out and like that's a, this is an uncommonly long period for Intel to be on the same platform, same chipset, some socket and everything. Yeah, so, two CPUs. Right. So I'm actually thinking like, OK, if 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 priority number one is for this thing to be as stable as possible, then this seems like 
even if it's an unexciting platform, it's probably the most mature and stable at this point. Well, it seems like if you don't do stupid, like I did stupid, I did hot rod memory. If it seems like if I hadn't done yeah. hot rod memory, I probably wouldn't have had problems with memory yeah. at least. That, that actually would be an interesting aspect to this build is that I have an AMD Expo kit memory mm -hmm. kit. So like if I were to throw that, it would work. It would absolutely work. But you'd have to set it up manually though. Like the, the motherboard would probably, I'm quite sure an, an Intel motherboard is not going to be able to read a, a Expo profiles. I wonder if so, it also has the XMP profiles. It, it, it doesn't, does it? Doubt it. Unless maybe there's some internal mechanism for like exposing both formats. I don't know. I doubt it. I that's highly an, doubt it. That's an Adam would know um, that answer. I don't, I yes, don't know that one, yes. unfortunately. But I, I assume you could just set all the timings manually and be just fine. Yeah, you can always set the timings manually. It'll yeah. be just fine. It's just like there's at this point, the number of memory timing settings is it's, it's, it's gone crazy. from like, hey, voltage and clock speed to it's shit that I don't even understand. Right. And I've been doing this for 20 years. Like, so. it, it, yeah, it was like it, it was it was clock voltage and like the four the four basic like cast latency type yeah. metrics. And now there are like every what? board I've touched in the last five years exposes like a two dozen extra you sub strobe, timings. You got your strobe. You know what your strobe yeah, is, Brett? You know your strobe to two latency is? Yeah. I don't know. The upside is that it feels like the like leaving everything on auto like memory training has gotten pretty good. It feels like to me. Like I've, I've, I've had some so. cases, I've had some cases where I was able to solve memory and stability stuff by just resetting everything to auto and letting the board figure it out. Maybe. Um, yeah. I haven't tried that actually. So, so I, I'm not too worried about putting AMD it, memory in. It, in Intel my experience, board. when I set my board to auto, it goes to the jet X speed, which is always really, yes. really slow. Yes. That's, that's what I had to do was let it figure all that stuff out. And then I just bumped the clock speed. This is on an older build that I'm no longer yeah, using. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think that memory would be fine. Um, and, and then after that bit, you have a thing that says water cooling, maybe. Uh, yeah. So that's the other weird thing I'm running into. Like one of the reasons I got this gigabyte board is they're like basically the only vendor on the market who is still spacing PCIe slots, which I need all of uh, out in such a way that you can use a big three of slot capture board. cards and Nick. Yes. Yeah, so I've got the, the high speed network card to go to my NAS and I've got the video capture card. Yeah. Um, Everybody, everybody generally is spacing the slots so that if you're using a three slot GPU, you can't use the second slot. It's just block. Right. And so that was part of why I picked this board in the first place. So if I swap to another board, that's most likely going to be an issue. So I could either get a smaller graphics card or I could just water cool the 4090. Which I'm, su is, I'm surprised that nobody's come up with a two slot 4090 at this point, honestly. I that might be something that'll happen eventually. I'm not going to say for sure. I but I I've heard I maybe some, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I would anyway. have thought it would have happened by now, but it, it may have, it may have happened. Actually, I could, uh, um, but, but the, uh, yeah, the water cooling is tempting. The only problem with the water cooling and, and I, so when I was at max PC, I always had water cooled. I always built water cooling loops mainly because there was just shit laying around and I could, I could idly put one together and then there yeah. I was. Yes. Um, it's, not, it's not cheap. I will tell you from looking well, just, just even the cursory survey of what's out there. It's not cheap. It's not even that, but like at max PC, I had my home machine that was basically just for playing games at home. And then we had test beds at the office. So when I needed to test something new, I used the test bed at the office. I didn't have to tear down my machine at home to test, test stuff. And when we moved over to tested that, that changed. Um, so, like it stopped being practical when I had to, like if I was going to test a new video card or something, I would have had to tear down the water cooling loop in order to put a new video card in, which is just more of a pain in the ass than that's, I was willing yeah. to deal with. That's obviously a non-starter. I mean, my hope if I did this, my hope is that I would get a combo of hardware that was solid enough that I could knock on wood. I mean, I know this is never actually the reality, but like as close as possible to just put it all together and get it going and then not touch it for the next two to three it, years. If it, like having looked at this stuff when I was going into the build for this machine, it seems like that's much more doable now. Like, especially if you have room for a couple of radiators and stuff like that, you, you can, you can, the all in one pumps with the reservoirs are more common and normal. Now it used to be that you had to find a place to put a big giant water cooling column. Have you, have, um, you, have you, have you heard how big my case is? It's pretty, but, but I mean, <laughs> it's, yeah, you have plenty of, you can yeah. put all the radiators is, in the world. You're, yeah, this, you don't have any is, problems. This is pretty much why I, I I bought the biggest case I could find just to leave options for any and everything that could possibly happen. I mean, you could fit a whole second computer in there if you, if you, if you spaced I, it out well. Probably. I was looking, some holes. I was looking at the manual yesterday. I think you can fit, gosh, what was it? You can fit a 360 millimeter, a 280 millimeter and a 420 millimeter radiator all in this case at one time. If, if you're. If you're willing to like, you know, that's that's with no optical drive. That's with like, you know, that's the maximal water cooling setup. But it's like absurd. The amount of 
I don't surf, surface area you can put in this thing. Do people even make 420 millimeter yes. radiators now? Yes, they do. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it's 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 less of an issue these days. And like you can do the all-in-one pumps with the rate with the reservoir on a on a self-built kit. So you don't have to have the big reservoir if you don't want to. Yeah. Um, my, it's all my, more manageable. My you you tell me my impression of the point of the reservoir from like two hours of looking at the stuff yesterday. A seems like an easier way to get water out of the line as it as it runs. The air and, out of the line, yeah. Or, or sorry, well, air, yes. Yeah. That's, that's what I meant. Sorry. Um well, yeah, bleed, bleed the air out as it runs, and, and B, it sounds like the more liquid in the loop in general, kind of the more efficient the cooling or the, the better the cooling. Well, well, the trick with water cooling is that the liquid has heat, has higher heat capacity, right? So right. it both transmits heat easier and and it, it holds a lot of heat. So, yeah, like like if you have an extra half liter of water in your reservoir, that's 80, kilo, 80 calories per degree Celsius of energy. Um or something like that. So like, yeah, it's, it's your, your, your holding capacity for heat in that loop will be more, the more liquid you have yes. in there. Yeah. That, that sounds appealing to me. I taught you some thanks to Robo Jeff on the discord talked to him some yesterday about this stuff. And yeah. And he basically said it like the, the more you overbuild the heat, capacity the quieter the whole thing will be obviously because the fans don't need to run as hard so well yeah because it sounds appealing like the, the 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 trick is it takes 80 calories of heat per gram of water per degree celsius right to raise it to raise the temperature at one degree celsius so that means yeah like you literally it will it will take longer for the whole loop to raise the temperature which means it'll take longer for your fans to spin up because presumably if you do this you have a way to measure the liquid temperature and and that's what you set your fan curves to for the radiators right and then and then yeah it's 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 a good this it's it's a nice way to do it the de- yeah. the trade off is that machine essentially is a is a you're not going to change that and you're never going to have the brand new video card because it always takes them six months to make new water yeah. blocks for the new yeah. video cards. Yes, the, the, the machine would become kind of a fixed point in time. Yeah, um, which is fine. The, the way you use computers, it totally works. Yeah, like I just I just need this thing to go for the next two, three years, especially like Intel is going to ride out this tile transition. Like yeah. he's got its issues. Like it would be nice to have something just kind of old and reliable until everybody sorts their stuff out. I, this is a big hierarchy of maybes. Yeah. Like, am I even going to swap the board? If I do, am I going to actually have these cooling issues? If that's the case, am I going to water cool? Like it's a big, maybe to all of it, but it's, it's fun to think about. And well, if, if gigabyte gets their shit together and gives you a firmware update that fixes the problem, then I mean, if they unequivocally come out and say, Hey, we have identified this issue and fixed it in this bios update, then yeah. Like anything short of that, I feel like I'm, I don't know. I mean, even if they didn't say that, if I made it six months without a crash, Maybe then I would feel okay. But I, I, I'm just, I'm sorry you've had such a problem with it. Like ah, that's that, okay. that, that no. kind of stuff. That kind of stuff is maddening because it's like the computer's gaslighting you and you don't know whether I, yes. it's you or if, if you've done something wrong or if like, yeah, that's, it's hard to deal I, with. I, I, I will deal with problems all day long when it's clear what the problem is and how yeah. to do about it. But when it's this, it's this nebulous, invisible, like something is just, yeah. I, I, I think you may have actually had worse issues than I have so far. I mean, um, the uh, the memory dying and the CPU memory controller conking out were annoying, but not like that. It was easy to fix because it was yeah. just like RMA and get the new hardware and then you're back in business. Sure. Um, anyway, if any, anybody in the discord wants to hit me up about water cooling stuff, maybe that would be fun to talk about. There you go. Uh, I I bought something stupid a couple of weeks ago oh. and put it in and set it up. Um, so... I have in my computer a bunch of fractal fans, aspect fans uh, that have RGB and they're they're plugged directly into headers on the motherboard uh, for the for the fans side. But the RGB, I had them daisy chained because they're set up to do that. But when you daisy chain these fans, they're daisy chained in daisy chained in parallel, which means each of the fans has like six LEDs on it. But when you daisy chain them, instead of seeing three fans on a chain you you don't see 18 leds you see six leds and then all of the fans mirror each other basically right i wasn't able to get the smooth transitions from front to back and top to bottom on my radiators and my mm-hmm. fans that i wanted with that mm-hmm. so i looked at I, i've been using open rgb to control the the lights on the computer for a while uh, open rgb is nice because it uses open source uh, interfaces with the hardware so you don't have to install all of the software that the vendors ship so i don't have like razor chroma and asus's thing and all the different bullshit on the computer i just have this one piece of software We've, we may have said this exact thing 
before, but it sounds like it's basically Home Assistant for RGB. It, it, it is very similar to Home Assistant in that it works without having to have... The, sometimes Home Assistant has to have the other stuff installed someplace, though, just for the record. But, but yes, um, it is it is very similar ethos. The, the idea is that you could just install this one piece of software and all of the, it'll see all of your RGB stuff. So I uh, bought a, a open RGB compatible... Um, uh, a light controller from which is a Razer Chroma. They, they do one that has fan control and USB, and one that's just USB. I bought the just uh, just just ARGB. I bought the just ARGB one. Plugged all of the fans directly into that thing, and then I was like, okay, how do I actually make this work? And it turns out the best way, uh, the, because the fans are spread usually in a in a, like a hexagon shape around the edge of the fan hub, uh, the the hub of the fan inside the the hub. The best thing to do was to look at each fan, identify each of the LEDs, and then place them relatively where they are in the vertical height or the horizontal height of the fan. And I did all that, and I put them. I, I represented them in the in the map, the visual. Uh, our Open RGB has a plugin that lets you make like a a two D visual map of all the lights in the computer. And I I did them as linear, linear, either horizontal or vertical lines. So now when I start with a gradient at the bottom of the case and go to the top, I get like smooth transitions from blue to purple to green to purple to blue to green to purple to green oh, to purple. Yeah. It's it's super sick. Now that wasn't I, I wanted to make it more difficult. Of course. And I looked at my drop control, which I had I had kind of cheated and I just built a pro a color profile for it that matched but wasn't synced up with the uh the case. And um somebody's released QMK QMX, sorry, firmware for the mechanic the drop is a 10 keyless mechanical uh keyboard uh with RGB wired. And somebody released QMX firmware, and I built a QMX firmware for my drop with all my shit on it that has open RGB support because there's a, there's a QMX plugin for open RGB now. And now open RGB can control the lighting on my QMX keyboard, which I didn't think was ever going to be possible because of overhead involved in real time. Huh? And, uh, then I went one I step like, further. Yeah. I feel like this is leading somewhere. Well, so then I went one step further cause I've been playing a little bit of counter strike two lately. And you know, that's a game that has some fancy keyboard shit going on. And I looked at Artemis and Aurora. Uh, if you don't know what Artemis and Aurora are, Aurora has been around for a really long time now, but it's a open source interface for your RGB keyboards and mice and headsets and all that stuff to, to let you kind of... The, so in the world of RGB keyboards and mice and nonsense, the every manufacturer has their own APIs. And like for a long time, they would do exclusive deals like Logitech would be the would be the the wow uh, vendor and Razer would do Counter Strike and blah, blah, blah. Aurora just gives you open source wrappers for all the other all the other uh, hardware vendors okay. so that like your RGB keyboard from Logitech or Corsair or Razer, or whoever works with all the other game APIs. Uh, the Aurora, the guy who ran Aurora for a long time has taken a break. So somebody forked off that project has been working on it on a separate fork called Aurora RGB for a couple of years now. Uh, so if you haven't had an Aurora update in a minute, you might want to check and, and switch over to, to the new fork because it's well updated. And that new fork has an open RGB API hook. So open RGB runs a server, an API server, and you can just connect, connect uh, apps into it. So now I can run my Counter Strike bullshit and my Fortnite bullshit, and I can run it on just the keyboard, or alternately, I can make it take over the entire case and do all sorts of buck wild stuff in the case when, like, I'm dancing in Fortnite or I get a kill in Counter Strike or whatever. I, first of all, I'm going to say real quick that I did not have on my 2023 bingo card. Will becomes an RGB guy necessarily. I mean, technically, that was really a 2022 uh, okay. card, but it's the RGB uh, stuff's really fun. I, I didn't expect to like it, but I did. Yeah, it's, it's quite, I, it's, I don't know. I, I, I get it, I guess. Um, is your is your machine in the shot when you're streaming? It is not because my no. cables aren't long enough. That's the next. So, OK, two things, because because like if you're streaming, especially as much as you stream Fortnite, for example, if you were to integrate those things in a way that people could see them. And I guess I actually kind of see the point. So there's, there's, there's two notes to that. One is that 
I have I have a, a skin a face condition that sometimes gives me a gnarly face rash. I haven't had the camera on in like a year, maybe eight oh. months at this point. Wow. Wait, um, you mean you can just stream without a camera now? So I also was getting a lot of why are you playing Fortnite grandpa comments from the kids when I was mm-hmm. playing Fortnite. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the not streaming with the camera on knocked both of those way down. Sure. Um, the uh, at some point. I wouldn't mind having the like I have a I I have a space behind me to put a shelf with the computer on it and I wouldn't mind having the computer back there where it's actually visible because it actually looks I mean it looks like a you know it's gratuitous and full of RGB bullshit but it looks cool it looks it's a sick RGB bullshit at this point um at some point I'll probably set the camera back up and do that but if for right now it's just me and me and my business on the uh on the floor underneath me but let me let me ask real quick. Is there any actual utility to the game specific profiles for the keyboard? Like, is it actually lighting up specific keys that are valuable in, in that game? Depends on the game. So uh, like Fortnite, I think it just plays an animation on the keyboard when you're dancing. That's like time to the music of whatever the emote is. Uh, the 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 I want to say like Apex and League of Legends, like the old R- the old RTS ones would have all the keyboard shortcuts highlighted. So if you like press control, you can see what the what the what the different what different options are available oh, to you. So when you're learning key presses and stuff, yeah, that's cool. Um, League of Legends and Dota do the same thing. Um uh, Battlefield had had different modes highlighted based on what's going on in the game. It really is up to the to the game vendor how much stuff they expose. Like we 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 talked to a couple of people about doing that for the end of Crisis when we were launching. We we're like, I don't think it's worth the effort um, because it would have taken an engineer a while to figure it out. And also, there's an information hierarchy aspect to it that you have to kind of like it, like it needs to make sense, I guess. Um, the other thing I learned as a result of this is that the people who originally worked on Aurora, when the f- main developer of Aurora took the break, forked off and made this new thing called Artemis that's all layer based and is much, much more powerful, but still pretty early. It also has an open RGB API hook in so you can control all your open RGB stuff with it. And um, it seems really, really cool. Uh, they, they have a plugin infrastructure for building new integrations So if the game has a mod or a hook, like Terraria has mods, so you can build a mod that hooks into that and feeds information to the keyboard thing. And then then you get like full keyboard highlighting in Terraria, like some of them, some of them flash when you take damage, some of them like it's it's there's an aspect to it that's kind of cool. But like also it's mostly for show. It's mostly just because it's because it's cool more than useful. It's 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 both it's it's useful superfluous bullshit. Uh, the the one the one that's the noteworthy good one is the Overwatch one, where everybody has different keyboard shortcuts. All the characters have different keyboard shortcuts, and it highlights all of them. But it also changes to the color of like your your character's skin, so you know that you're playing Diva or whatever when you when you load it up because it gets all pink and shit. Just in case you forgot which character you were playing, who exactly. was on the screen at all times. Yeah, in case you had your eyes closed or were just looking straight down at the ground, you know. Um, so yeah, that's it. The open RGB compatible QMX firmware is on the open RGB page now. Uh, and it was, it was a little scary cause there were a couple of messages that were like, yo, if you make too big a firmware and you try to flash it, it's going to break your keyboard. So be careful. Um, but I didn't break my keyboard and, uh, oh, and also by the way, we don't know how big the maximum size for this keyboard is. So, you know, be careful. And then I used the drop uh, keyboard firmware updater with that third party firmware I made and it worked just fine. And it would presumably would have warned me, I guess. I don't know. Cool. Um, cool. Yeah. All right. So that's it. That's a potpourri, I guess. Yeah. Just in time for me to not quite start thinking about mechanical keyboards again. I think if we had talked for about another 30 seconds about it, I did, might have started looking at wait, keyboards. Did again. you see the 8 Famicom one? That's dude. That is the reason. That's been several months now, I think. It's out now. You can buy it. Oh, no, did it just actually come out? Yeah, it's actually shipping. announcement. When I saw that thing get announced a few months ago, like that was the thing that got me back in hard of having a very hard time resisting having a keyboard in the original Famicom color scheme. It has the Kata on the key, keycaps. And also you get the two big AB oh. buttons. If you get the Famicom version and not yeah. the NES version, <clears throat> I did. I did see some people kind of annoyed that the the Kana on the keycaps doesn't actually correspond to like the. Oh what know, is it like Shift Gist or like what is the what's the encoding people? Is that still what people use? I don't, to I don't know what Japanese. Sure. Use. Anyway, apparently they don't actually correspond to the right keystrokes for those characters, which is a little bit <laughs> that's stupid, questionable. 
Okay, um, I'm, I'm like 20% less in, entranced with that. Yeah. But like the cool, I mean, the cool thing about modular keycap sets is you could kind of actually just build your own color scheme that's true. of that, right? Which is probably it, what I would do. I wish that they, I, I hope that this sells well. I'm not going to buy one of these, but I hope that it sells well enough that they make a SNES version with the Japanese SNES colors in a couple of years. Okay. Yeah. I would, I would be, I would be into that. Japanese SNES is, is mostly just two tones of gray. Unless you're, unless you're getting the little four color. I want the four color. Yeah. If you integrate the four color logo stuff somewhere, then that would look cool. Yeah. I specifically want the four color thing. There's just, there's something about that combination of maroon and beige and gray from eighties. that was does very it, common in the eighties. to you? Japanese computers and the Famicom that is just, yes. I anyway, am. Anyway, I am, let's let's uh, yeah. let's wrap here before I try to go spend money on something. Go, it's only ninety nine bucks. That's a pretty good deal for a mechanical starter keyboard. For what it's worth, it's Bluetooth too, Brad. It mm-hmm. has a physical switch to turn it from two point four G to Bluetooth and mm-hmm. off. And the red light lights up in the corner to let you know it's on if you buy the Famicom version. I'm making a face. It's a good face. That's that's a, I need a new keyboard face. What, um, if, what if what if I make my thank you patrons face? Well, so. <laughs> I was going to say, I almost bought it just to hook up to the mister. Yeah, I can see that yeah. for sure. Anyway, uh, the thank you patrons face is where we say at the end of every episode, thank you patrons. Yes. With a big smile. We can't see it, but we, yeah, we're always happy to hear from you all. Uh, thank you so much for supporting the show. Brad will made a tech pod is 100% a listener supported show. So if you would like to help us make the show, we don't run ads or anything like that. If you would like to help us make the show, you can go to patreon.com slash tech pod again. That is patreon.com slash tech pod. And the internet tells me I have to say that three times. So I'm going to say it one more time. You should go to patreon.com slash tech pod. And for five bucks a month, you get access to the fabulous tech pod discord full of people talking about things like busted ass gigabyte motherboards and mechanical keyboards. And um, I don't know. I was talking about uh, uh, the my RGB stuff the other day. Like we we can, we check in. We learn stuff. Everybody helps each other. It's a lovely community. Talking to people who are running Asahi Linux on their brand new M2 MacBook Pros this morning. That's madness. Absolute madness. Um, and you also get access to the patron exclusive episode where we talk about uh, what's well, kind of different things. Sometimes it's sometimes it's a ramble about whatever we're thinking about, what we're thinking about upcoming episodes. Uh, sometimes it's spillover, uh, spillover content from question the questions episode at the end of the month. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's just like things we think are cool. Yeah. Um, and you, again, you go to patreon.com slash check pod. We like to thank all of our patrons, but especially our executive producer tier patrons, including Nick Johnston, Paddle Creek Games Makers of Fractured Vale, Andrew Slosky, Jordan Lippett. This one's just dollar sign now. Hmm. Uh, Wedge says, join the tech pod holiday gift swap. That's in the holiday tech swap channel in the discord. If you'd like to join that Joel Krauska, Twinkle Twinkie, David Allen, James Kamek and Pantheon makers of the HS three high speed 3d printer. I did not see them at maker fair. I did look so it's possible. I missed them, but that would have been an interesting rendezvous. Uh, it was weird at maker fair. I will say because I mean, I'm not weird, but it's funny because I wouldn't expect people to recognize me at this point, having not made videos in eight years. And a bunch of people said hi. I uh, I walked in front of some guy's shot while he was taking a picture and didn't realize it. And I said, oh. I'm sorry. And he said, it's no problem, Will. Rookie mistake. And my daughter looked at me and she was like, did you know that guy? I was like, no, I had no idea who he was. Must be a, must be a listener or viewer or whatever. So it's always nice to see people. We had a couple of met a couple of people and their kids. Um, it was really fun. So thanks for supporting the show, everybody. We appreciate yeah. you. Yes, thank you. And we will be back next week with another edition of the Tech Pod. See you then.